And we're continuing with the eighth chapter of the Spell of the Sorcerer's Skull. We have discovered a book of some sort that mentions the Great Reckoning in a little room by somebody named Warren Windrow. And I want to apologize for playing so much with the characters' voices during this story. Um, after reading that Johnny was from Long Island initially, I did try to play with a Long Island accent. I've been trying more with New England accents in the previous chapters, but um, I'm going to just settle on doing the voices as I have been doing them. So if that was if that took you out of the story at all to hear me do the voices in different ways, I, uh, I do apologize. But let us get back to the story. Well, I'll be darned, exclaimed Father Higgins. With an odd expression on his face, he reached out and carefully peeled back the flyleaf. Now they were looking at the title page. At the top, large black letters said, La Clavicule de Salomon. Under this title was a crude engraving of a leering demon's face inside a circle, and around the outside of the circle, the word Asroth. Or, sorry, Azoth was repeated over and over. Father Higgins wrinkled up his nose as if he were smelling something unpleasant. As Fergie held the book steady for him, the priest rifled quickly through several pages. This is a book of black magic, he said, looking up at last. It's printed in French, and my French isn't terribly good, but I can make out enough to tell what's being said. Now, then something happened. Johnny reached out and for the first time actually touched the book, which began to steam and smoke. With a loud yell, Father Higgins, with a loud yell, Fergie dropped it. And the other two leaped back. The pages of the book began to writhe and twist, and more whitish smoke curled upward. It was burning, being consumed by a fire that could not be seen. In a few minutes, there was nothing left on the ground but a heap of gray ashes. Angels and ministers of grace defend us, breathed Father Higgins as he crossed himself. What? I mean, how come? stammered Johnny in confusion. You are wearing the silver cross, said Father Higgins solemnly. And you touched the cursed thing, and so it was destroyed. He heaved a deep sigh and turned to Fergie. Byron, I don't know what crazy or blessed force it was that drove you to go into that house and bring that book out, but you have given us our first good lead. Warren Windrow. Hmm, I wonder who he was. And why he dreamed the same phrase that was given to us by the mysterious writing that we found under the statue. Well, come on, gentlemen. We're going back up to the library. John, are you able to navigate okay? Johnny nodded. Most of the queasiness and dizziness had worn off, and he felt more like himself again. With Fergie on one side of him and Father Higgins on the other, he climbed the hill once more. Above them, the windows of the library glowed yellow, and all around the trees rustled in the night breeze that had suddenly sprung up. When they reached the front steps of the library, Father Higgins told the boys to wait outside. He said that he had a pretty good idea what kind of book he wanted to look for, and he wouldn't be long. So Fergie and Johnny sat down on the granite steps and waited. They watched the stars and listened to the shrill piping of May frogs in some nearby pool. Finally, Father Higgins returned, and from the way he was grinning and rubbing his hands together, they knew he had found something. "'Hey, Father, what is it?' asked Fergie as he scrambled to his feet. "'Did you find out who the guy was?' "'Yes, indeed!' "'Or I did indeed!' exclaimed the professor." who was practically bubbling over with self-satisfaction and triumphant glee. Yes, I most certainly did. Come along, gentlemen, and I'll tell you everything. Father Higgins started walking toward a clump of dark, shadowy trees that rose from the, on the horizon. Hey, Father, exclaimed Johnny, running after him. The inn's back that way. I, yes, I know it is, said Father Higgins as he strode along. But we aren't going to the inn. We're going down to the beach, to a boathouse run by a guy named Hank Dodge. When I was out here last year, I rented a boat from him, and I think I'm going to do it again. He also sells camping supplies and canned food to dumb landlubbers like us who come out here without being prepared to go on an expedition. Johnny's mouth dropped open. Expedition? Father, where are we going? Yeah, come on, Father, added Fergie, who was walking on the other side of him. Give us the whole story. For a few minutes, Father Higgins walked on in silence. The boys found that they were on a winding blacktop road, and the tarred surface felt hard now after the spongy earth they had been treading on. At last, Father Higgins was ready to talk. He took a deep breath and began to explain that he had had to leaf through three books of old New England legends before he found the story he was looking for. It was in a book called Weird Tales of the Maine Seacoast, and told of a man named Warren Windrow, whose ghost 
supposedly had been seen a few times on Vinylhaven and on some of the nearby islands. Back in the 1840s, he had lived on Cemetery Island, which was just a dot on the map out in Hurricane Sound, not far from Vinylhaven. Windrow had come from a large family that once lived in, Penobsc in the Penobscot Bay area, and the family had a sinister reputation, though the book didn't say why. Well, one day, Warren Windrow caught the California gold fever that was sweeping the eastern half of the country in those days, and he went out to California to see if he could strike it rich. Windrow didn't find any gold, but he did get into a saloon fight with another Easterner, a man from Vermont named Lucius J. Childermass. Windrow got beaten up, and apparently he decided to get even, because one night, sometime after the fight, he jumped Lucius in an alley and tried to kill him with a bowie knife. Lucius got cut up a bit, but some people who were passing in the street nearby broke up the fight and rescued Lucius. Windrow was taken to San Francisco, where he was tried for attempted murder, convicted, and hanged. And that's the whole story, as far as I got, can get it from the book I read, said Father Higgins, finishing up. So we have the ghostly Warren Windrow and a book of black magic that he once owned, and a tale that connects him with the professor's granduncle. This is all beginning to make sense in a weird way. Our next step will be to go and have a little look at Cemetery Island. It's not far, only half an hour's ride. I know Byron here is raring to go, but I thought I'd ask if you wanted to stay behind, John. You can wait for us, and no one will think you coward, you're cowardly or anything like that. And for all I know, we may not find anything but sand and seashells. We ought to be back pretty quick in any case. What do you say, John? Johnny squared his jaw and looked determined as he possibly could. He was still feeling a bit shaky because of the ghastly experience he had just had, but he wasn't going to be cheated out of an adventure. Besides, the professor was more his friend than anybody else's, or so he felt anyway. I want to go, father, he said defiantly. You'll have to tie me up and chain me to a tree if you want me to stay here. The road they took petered out into a sandy track that wound over some grassy hummocks and past a long, narrow pond that glimmered in the starlight. Before long, they arrived at a little cove with a few houses clustered around its edges. At the end of a row of white clapboard shanties stood the old harbor boathouse, a big, sprawling building with cedar shingles and a slate roof. Next to the boathouse was a little pokey building with a sagging roof and a metal stove chimney. A sign that leaned against the house gave the name of the establishment and listed the rental rates and the name of the owner in straggling white letters. Hank Dodge, Prop. Father Higgins knocked loudly on the door of the house, and Hank Dodge came out. He wore saggy blue work pants, a red and white hunting jacket, and a fishing hat stuck full of fishing flies. His face was red-veined and jolly, and his breath smelled of whiskey. Father Higgins told him what he wanted and pressed a wad of bills into his hand. While waiting for Hank to return, Father Higgins made a list in his head and rattled it off to Fergie. A couple of cans of beans, a mess kit, a can of sterno, matches, a tarpaulin, three flashlights, and a bottle of brandy. Fergie recited this list again, took some money from Father Higgins, and raced off down the beach toward a lighted store that he saw in the distance. Hank Dodge returned with the keys to the boat and an oil lantern and led Johnny and Father Higgins around to the back door of the boathouse. A few minutes later, Fergie, Johnny, and Father Higgins were skimming along over a body of water known as Hurricane Sound. Off to their left, in the distance, rose, a low hump, rose the low humped shape of Hurricane Island. Overhead, a few stars could be seen through a filmy overcast sky, and from out in the direction of the open sea came ominous rumbles and, the, and occasional lightning flashes. A storm was moving into the mouth of the bay. Johnny sat on the bow seat. He clung tightly to the sides of the boat and felt absolutely petrified. Motorboat, roads, motorboat rides had always scared the dickens out of him. Fergie sat in the middle seat, arms folded and a calm expression on his face. And in the stern sat Father Higgins. He chewed at his empty pipe and maneuvered the steering handle of the motor. Out toward the entrance of the sound, they shot, a long white wake spewing behind them, and a loud engine drone filling the air. They were on their way toward what? Johnny could not, for the life of him, imagine how all this was going to end, but as he, as he sat there with the motorboat hurling along beside him, 